Welcome. Oh, you're too kind. Oh, stop it. Cut it out. You are too kind. <laughs> oh, goodness, guys. I get even cornier as the days go by. The older I get, the cornier I get. But welcome to the Benjamin Dixon Show podcast only. Um, thanks so much for joining us. There are so many things to talk about tonight. Um, some are super sad. Some are just kind of like scratch your head. Like, why? And then others are a tad bit infuriating. Um, hopefully I can get through all of them. Let's start with the thing that's a little bit infuriating. Not a little, a lot infuriating. Nashville. Mm-hmm. The Nashville Statement. So uh, I'm just going to read a quick sum- quick summary from the USA Today um, because I think they uh, summarize it pretty succinctly. Um, a nationwide coalition of more than 150 conservative Christian leaders signed a statement released Tuesday affirming their beliefs on human sexuality, including that marriage is between one man and one woman and approval of homosexual immorality is sinful. Um, and it's an organization, it's a Council on Biblical Manhood and Womanhood's list of 14 beliefs referred to as the Nashville Statement is a response to an increasingly uh, increasingly post-Christian Western culture that thinks it can change God's design for humans according to the statement. The statement said, quote, our true identity as male and female persons is given by God. It's not only foolish, but hopeless to try to make ourselves what God did not create us to be. The statement from the coalition member reads, oh, okay, uh, yeah, my inflection wasn't correct there, but you get the point. Um, so one more paragraph and then we'll discuss it. The Council on Biblical Manhood and Womanhood convened a meeting of evangelical leaders, pastors, and scholars Friday at the Southern Baptist Convention's Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission's annual conference in Nashville. The coalition, coalition discussed and endorsed the statement. All right. Uh, do I have a boo in here? I don't think I have a boo. No, that's not a boo. Um, no, I don't have a boo. What? There should be a boo. What's this? Okay, I kind of like that. I don't know what the hell it is, but I like that. But besides the point, the point is like, man, when will religious people get it in their head that... People either want to willingly live by your religious code or they don't. And if they don't, there's nothing that you can do about it, particularly in the United States, unless you want to do away with the Constitution and create a a Christian version of Sharia law. Why? I I think it's it's very simple, man. Like, listen, a lot of people I, I saw one tweet that said, Oh, the Nashville Statement is totally Christian. Well, I mean, that's arguable. You know, you could have different theologians from different perspectives argue. I'm not here to argue whether it's biblical or not. I'm here to argue what relevance does it have in terms of the lives of people who don't give a damn. Like, this is, this is why insert, hmm, let's see. I happen to hate, what do I hate? Um... I, I I hate people who chew gum with their mouths open. Why would I make it my life's calling to go around the world and try to make sure that everyone chews with their mouth closed? It makes absolutely no sense. And as ridiculous of an example as that is, it's very similar in this. If, if a person wants to chew with their mouths open, I can't force them to do anything else but what they want to do. And, and this is, there's a difference between proselytizing and witnessing and trying to convince people that your religion is the way to go and harassing people, harassment. And part of me feels like this Nashville statement is just a statement of harassment because it's not going to, it's not intended to change uh, the views of people who don't believe in this. That's, I mean, that's really my whole perspective. It's like, they, you, you have to, sure, fine. You want to declare to the world that you don't believe in homosexuality. Motherfucker, we, we knew that about you a long time ago. <laughs> you know, we understood that. Like, this is not break. This is like you're getting to the point of harassment. We know that most evangelical pastors believe that homosexuality is the sin of the sin of all sins. And God, if you do that sin, then you're just uniquely sinful. You're just an abomination. Never mind all the other abominations listed in the Bible. It's the abomination of homosexuality that we're worried about. 
You know, this is this is this is what they just I I don't get it beyond their obsession with controlling human sexuality. Because what else? What other reason do you have to try to get involved in someone's sexuality if not to control it or to enjoy it yourself? <laughs> you know, that's that's always the best reason to get involved with someone's sexuality. I mean, upon request. Right. You know, someone uh, allows you entrance. But anyway, that's besides the point. But the 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 entire thing is that they really want to control human sexuality. They don't want anyone to have sexual encounters outside of their approved uh, of their approved orthodoxy. And it's not that they want to control it all. Most of the time, it's not because they want to control it for religious reasons. They want to control it for their own personal sexual desires. Now, there's a little leap between those two statements. I will admit that that's not always the case. But in so many cases, we do see preachers who are out here pounding the drums of sexual purity and sexual morality. Meanwhile, they're screwing all the women in the church or they're closeted uh, homosexuals. Like, you know, to, I mean, instead of just being who they are, they preach against it out of some type of uh, weird self-hatred as though preaching against homosexuality is going to help them purge themselves of homosexual. I don't quite understand that. That's why I'm, I'm sounding so hesitant as I say it. But we've seen cases of this time and time and again where preachers, particularly evangelical, white evangelical pastors, preach so fervently against homosexuality uh, or being gay. And I, I don't even I don't know, being gay and then turn around. They're soliciting male prostitutes. And get arrested for it. So, you know, it's totally, I'm not quite sure that psychosis, but we see it time and again where the people who are preaching the hardest against a certain sexual lifestyle are the main ones who are indulging in that lifestyle. And they're doing it in a, in a sense of, um, of repressed sexuality versus, versus just living their life. I mean, God, dog, they can't even live their life. And they're trying to tell you how to live your life. I, that shit gives me a headache, man. <laughs> it really gives me a headache. It gives me a headache because I'm like, there's so much freedom. And getting to the point in your life as particularly men, I guarantee you probably 90% of the people on this panel were men, if not 100, because it's evangelicals, good chance they don't even believe in women preachers. But... Particularly men, it's such a liberating point when you realize someone else's sexuality has absolutely nothing to do with you. Okay, I'll give you an example. I remember when I was younger and I was uh, trying to be celibate, celibate, um, and I used to always be, obs you know, not obsessed, but like, you know, wanting, you know, wanting the girl of my dreams to be celibate too. And and that thing is like that's a super like that's a perfect combination for you to drive yourself crazy. And one day I just realized what I choose to do with my sexuality has absolutely nothing to do with what somebody else does with theirs. And 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 that the other individual is free to live their life completely removed from my sexual expectations. Like and this is what I'm talking about when I was young, like high school young man. I tried to be celibate in high school and you know. And, it, it didn't work out too well, but it worked um, to a certain extent. But, you know, when you're young and you're stupid, you feel like, you know, you feel like you have some say in the sexuality of other people, particularly people you're interested in. And then you grow the hell up and you realize, yeah, everybody has complete autonomy over their body. And what they do with their body is their business. And most importantly, none of mine. And I think that would bode well for religious zealots to get that in their head that they do not have the, I mean, okay, let's do it from a religious perspective. God doesn't control their sexuality. You know, if, even if you, if you believe in God, God doesn't control their sexuality. People do whatever they want to with their bodies. So why does a preacher feel like they have some say over what a person does with their body? Makes absolutely no sense except for the fact of what I said. People like to control, particularly pastors with repressed sexuality, like to control the sexuality of other people. 
They want to limit other people to their expectations of sexual encounters. They want to limit it to their understanding or what they're comfortable with. They don't want anyone to do anything sexual beyond their personal comfort level. And and, and the thing is, it's, it's really simple. I, what you do in your bed has nothing to do with me. It's none of my business. So if it bothers me, I shouldn't even know it bothers me because I shouldn't even know what the hell you're doing unless I'm being too damn nosy. This, this is this is really a deep rabbit hole when you get into it like this, this incessant need, not incestuous need, but incessant need to control or to put your expectations or put your religious morality out into the public to try to control or to make a declaration to the, you know, who are they declaring this to? That I, I'm sorry if I'm stammering and, and, and rambling, but I'm just kind of curious, who are they declaring this to? And what do they, what do they expect to get from this? They're not going to be able to change the law. Not so long. I mean, I, I guess there are mechanisms for them to do that. Are they going to actually pass a law banning homosexuality? No. Are they going to try to repeal uh, uh, Obergefell versus Hodges, the Supreme Court case that brought us uh, marriage equality? Well, that's going to be hard because I do believe John Roberts, the, uh, the Supreme Court, um, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, actually voted. Nope. I'm sorry. Take that back. Rewind. I remember his dissent. His dissent was very vociferous. So let me not make that mistake. But Kennedy was the swing vote that actually put uh, Oberfeld versus Hodges, uh, the law of the land. So perhaps uh, if Kennedy retires this summer, uh, which he didn't, the summer's almost over. But next summer, um, perhaps there's a way that they can overturn marriage equality. But that only overturns it for maybe a generation. It's not something that they're going to be able to stop in the long run because because in the long run, idiocy like this is going to die out and people are going to be free to do with their bodies as they please. I, I think I, I keep putting it in that context, man, because that's ultimately what it is. Like, I, I don't want to be crude or, you know, I'm very much a prude myself. But I mean, I can definitely conjure up some examples to say that to express the level of freedom that people have with their own bodies. And keep in mind, I'm talking about their bodies and the bodies of people who are adult consenting adults, right? So that precludes any type of uh, anything that is illegal that that these evangelicals seem to be obsessed with. Also, they seem to think that there's like no distance between being a gay man and being a pedophile, which says a lot about their understanding of sexuality or the lack thereof. But this is a fascinating, this is a fascinating declaration to me, not because of what they said, because what they say, what they said is the same thing they've been saying forever. But it's fascinating to me that they felt the need to declare this. I'm like, who the fuck are you declaring this to, man? Like the people who you would like to change their ways don't give two shits about what you think about their sexuality. And you know what? In America, that's their right. Matter of fact, in biblical terms, that's their right. If they so choose to say, hey, I don't care what God says, the, there's actually room for that in the Bible, you know. There's actually freedom for people to do whatever the hell they want to do, even in the Bible. So constitutionally and biblically, like, who who are you talking to? You know, and if it's a matter of, well, we've got to save these people from their sins, like, yeah, you know what, man? Somebody needs to save you from your hypocrisy. Somebody needs to save you from eating shrimp. Somebody needs to save your women from from putting on makeup, right? Let's let's go down the list of all the things in the Bible that are just wrong and that are abominations. Right? There's there's like I think over 600 sins in the book of Leviticus uh, alone. So, you know, yeah, if you're worried about sin, then you, I'm, I'm pretty sure we've all got a long list of things that we need to worry about. But the bigger point besides that, because most the, no, the bigger point is exactly this. If people choose not to live their lives according to religious doctrine, they are free to do that in the United States of America. And I'm not quite sure why evangelicals don't want to get that. And the only thing that makes sense to me is that they have this incessant need to control the sexuality of other people. And and that's actually the root of this entire obsession, right? This is not just something that came out just because the Bible says so. I mean, if we think about the time when the, in, you know most of the Bible was taking place and at least the New Testament and Roman era, I mean, Roman civilization was like, 
buck wild sexually. Like, I mean, they had a level of sexual freedom that we don't even can't even imagine here in the United States. Uh, but, you know, so it's not as though this is a natural uh, uh, evolution from the biblical times. Right. It's not as though. The, the, he, and actually, now that I've thought this through, I can actually say it more succinctly. It's not as though what we see people choosing to do with their bodies and their partners today is a unique thing that we've never seen in history. That's what I'm saying. So I'm like, who, you know, where is this obsession coming from? If not a particular, a very particular uh, set of moral codes as viewed by a puritanical society that that latched on to uh, Western civilization and has never left. And we're just getting to a place of, uh, I don't want to use the phrase sexual freedom, um, but to a place of, you know what, you mind your business. I'll mind mine. What I do in my bedroom. Here, here's another example. I hate to belabor this point, but this thing is so ridiculous and it's it, this Nashville statement is so ridiculous that, you know, we we might as well just delve into it. Right. Um, you know, I actually have people who religious people who try to tell uh, Christians that, you know, we can't uh, partake in oral sex and or we can't have sex doggy style. You know, we can't you know, they try to they try to regulate the type of positions that we like to get in. And I'm like, the only thing that's going to regulate the positions that I get in is how how physically in shape am I enough to do that position this year? That's it. Like, seriously, bro, like you are not going to regulate what happens in in the privacy of my home or the privacy of my car, or the privacy of wherever I can get it in. Like, I don't understand. And, and and yes, this is this is me. I'm saying this to Christians from a Christians like you're not going to you're not going to dictate the limitations of my sexuality. And I'm a Christian. <laughs> Bruh, <laughs> you're going to let somebody you're gonna let somebody tell me. Anyway, I'm not going to get too crass and vulgar with you guys. You know, I'm still approved. I'm still ultimately conservative, not in the political sense, but in just every other sense. I try not to cuss too much. Um, but yeah, I mean, really you have an entire movement. So, so this, this puritanical, uh, uh obsession that has been, that has latched on to Western civilization. I mean, it ebbs and flows, but man, sometimes when it flows, you get crap like the Nashville statement where they feel the need to come out and say what we already knew they believed. So they're not, they're not making a declaration, a new declaration to the world. What they're doing is basically amounts to 10 amounts to, to harassment, Right. Um, and that's all that's all I can really get out of that, um, because because politically it's the same exact political fight as it has always been. The political fight isn't going to change. You know, their standing with their God is not going to change because they're well documented. It's on the record that they don't believe that, you know, men can have affection sexually, be attraction to another man. I mean, I, and it, it, you know, one, one last thing, like it, this is pervasive even in the black community, right? Like, I can't, I can't just lay this all at the feet of uh, white evangelicals because that would just be f uh, hypocritical. Like, I mean, and and I can't lay it all at the feet of everybody else. I can lay some of this at my feet, right? I've, I've discussed with you all many a times uh, my evolution from from being uh, a homophobic, like straight out homophobic um, to actually confronting my own hypocrisy with regard to the issue and uh, coming full circle to the point where uh, the, the big, the most important thing to me is that one individuals are free to be whoever they want to be and whoever they choose to be, but also, whoever they are and whoever they always have been. I mean, if a person says they are something, I'm a firm advocate of, okay, that you, that's who you are. Only thing I draw the line at, and maybe this is hypocritical and we can argue about this, is transracial, right? People who are like, oh, I'm black today. No, Rachel Dolezal, you know, you might be black today, but then tomorrow you could be white when the cops pull you over. But I digress. That's not on the, that's not on the docket for today's conversation. Um, sorry, <laughs> but, but the point is, the point is I firmly believe that if a person now, you know, I had to mature, I was, I, I can't blame it all on being youthful. I could blame a lot of it on, you know, religious dogma, but just growing out of the need to be concerned about what somebody else does sexually 
or or this this ridiculous feeling uh you, you know it's it's straight homophobia right that you you feel offended that a guy kisses a guy in public i mean you know you you really have to grow past that and 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 so I only say that to say that I can't lay all of this at the feet of the Nashville statement people, even though I'm going to lay 99.999% of it there. But also I have to point to the black community because there's a strong level of uh, and I think it's probably in, 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 in every community. Right. There's a conservative vein in every community, um, the least of which is not the black community uh, that is extremely homophobic and that. uh that it, that that really exists on the intersection of bigotry, which is ironic because of the level of discrimination that African Americans and marginalized people have experienced in the United States. Uh, but but I'm sure there's quite a few black pastors who've signed on to this, uh, and, and this is this is something that is prevalent in the black community that we have not yet confronted in its totality, as though uh, you know the LGBTQ community is not a as though black people are not a part of the lgbtq community like really houseway i mean we some of our greatest thinkers even if even if they weren't the most brilliant people in the world that's besides the point but i just like to point out the fact that some of our greatest thinkers from the black community have been a part of the lgbtq community but anyway um so this nashville statement is a load of trash for all the reasons that number one, nobody ever try to make them think otherwise, right? I'm not, I'm not in the business of of convincing people to do anything that they don't want to do. I'm not going to try to make Christians have the same journey that I had to get over our homophobia, right? That's my journey. I'll tell you about the journey, and I'll tell you why I think it's right. But if you want to still preach this on Sunday mornings, you have the constitutional right to do so, and I also have the constitutional right to say that I think you're wrong, and I also have the constitutional right to not have to be bothered by your religious expectations of me or of my friends and that's the most important thing about this and that's what makes the Nashville statement so trash is because nothing that they're declaring in this statement is going to have any bearing on the actual constitutional rights of uh, individuals in the United States of America if it's a political statement, then it's the same exact political fight that we've been engaged in for uh, for for a long time. Right. If it's a political statement, if it's a religious statement, then God already knew what they what they believe. You know, they don't have to. Uh, are they declaring this for God? I mean, is God not big enough to already know? I thought God could read all of our minds. I mean, and not he wouldn't even have to read their minds like these mother. I'm sorry. These people like to preach this every single Sunday. So clearly. You know, clearly he knows. So who are they doing this for? And the only thing I can come up with is it was just this, basically just harassing the LGBTQ community, trying to tell them and make sure that they know their place in America and know that they are not welcomed in America. That to me. And that's, you know, what is, is harassment the right word? Is that a strong enough word? Um because I feel like it's not even strong enough when you think about it in context of the only purpose of this statement, right? In context, the only purpose of the statement is to remind is to remind the LGBTQ community that they are hated by the evangelical movement. And it, it, I'm I'm rarely at a loss for words, but I'm wondering if harassment. I don't feel like harassment is strong enough. So please leave in the comment section of wherever you're listening to uh, to this. Leave in the comment section what you think is a stronger word to describe uh, people making a um, a a manifesto to let an entire community know that they are not loved enough to allow them to exist the way they are. And we just and we just as a community wanted to let you remind you, the LGBTQ community, the evangelical movement just wanted to remind you that. That God doesn't love you or something, I'm 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 not sure exactly what the hell they're trying to say, but I do know that it, it, it is it is harassment um, and probably more. But the word escapes me. So help me with that. All right, let's move on. Let's talk about Joel Osteen real quick. One more time. Um, so it's a lot of going back and forth of whether or not Joel Osteen's church was flooded or no, it wasn't flooded, but the basement was flooded. Yeah, but the floors weren't flooded. And so and if the floors were flooded, the second floor is where most of yeah, the there's a lot of going back and forth. And and 
here's I don't really want to talk about Joel Osteen long because I talked about it pretty much a long time last night. Here's what I would say um, about Joel Osteen. Um, I have a lot of Christian friends who are taking this hard because they see it as an assault on Christianity from uh, people who aren't Christian. Uh, I'm, I'm like, well, I am a Christian and, and I am joining in on um, uh, on this dragging of, of um, Joel Osteen. Um, but for different reasons, probably than other people, but I get it. I get it. You know, this is an embarrassing moment. This is an embarrassing moment for Joel, Joel Osteen. He should have known better. All right. So it's hard for, it's hard for Christians to Christians who don't have anything to do with this dude. Like this is, this is the funny thing. Like, I mean, I guess, I guess we have a collective, uh, um, I don't know. I mean, yeah. I mean, we consider ourselves one big Christian family. Um, but, uh, <laughs> But I see no need to defend people when they're wrong. I mean, it's just really that simple. Um, it may be painful for me to have to admit that Obama was an imperialist, you know, but I have no need to defend him. He, no matter how much I feel like he's a part of our black family and I have to close down ranks and protect him from criticisms. Now, I have no requirement to defend a person when they're wrong. Even when they're family, like I might have a no, don't get me wrong. I'm not I'm not fronting to pretend as though I don't have that same knee jerk reaction. I do. But when I sit down and think about it and I and I process it and I take the time to actually consider the evidence um, and then I realize, dang, my guy is wrong on this. But then it dawns on me. Why am I defending a person that I have no responsibility to defend? Same exact thing with Joe Olstein. Like um, to my, you know, to people who have been defending him, he was just wrong here, you know. And there's really no other way to put it. And I think he was wrong because two reasons, like we discussed last night, he was so absorbed into his own world that he didn't realize his responsibility to the city. That's number one. And then two, because he didn't realize his responsibility to the city that that wasn't the first thing in his mind. The first thing in his mind, in my opinion, should have been how can I help. That's what makes me viscerally angry because I've seen smaller organizations and I've been a part of smaller churches who have done everything that we could with the little limited resources that we had to help. Because the very first thing that came in our got daggone mind was how can we help? And so I would just say this to all my Christian friends who are and some who may not be Christian. They might just like his book. I don't know why you would like his book. But for those of you who are who are defending Joel Osteen, you have no requirement to defend people when they're wrong. It's not like it's you. I could get I understand being, you know, rejecting a criticism of of you because you got to defend yourself. You got to save face and you're going to hold the line as long as you can. But. This is not you. Joel Osteen is not you. This is not an attack on broader Christianity. I don't know why, you know, strike that. I do understand why you would feel like that. But that's not what this is. This is pointing out that Joel Osteen, who has taken a whole lot from the city of Houston, forgot that he had a responsibility to give back to the city of Houston. Here's a second level of uh, the second thing I want to say about this and then we'll move on. Um, you know, sometimes. It takes criticism to get you right because that's exactly what happened. Now the doors of Lakewood Church are open and busloads of people are going in. And wow, it looks like the floor wasn't flooded after all, but that's neither here nor there. What's important is that they open up the doors and people who were basically homeless because of the flood now have a place to stay. And I say that because I, 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 point that I point to that specifically because it it it's an important lesson for all of us to learn sometimes good or bad people I don't care what you describe Joel Osteen I'm going to talk about good people right now sometimes even the best of us need to be reminded to not be a jerk and I would just use myself as an example yet again. I have uh, my friend Anoa, man. My friend Anoa, she, I, I let her down like at least twice, at least twice. And and I had to have friends, and she came to me, and other people came to me to remind me, Ben, this is the time where you you should be here, present for your friend. What are you doing, Ben? <laughs> you know, and you know what I was doing. 
I was busy being absorbed in my own life. And had not I had friends who would come to me and say, and, and Anoa who just came to me and, say, and, and call me out. And, and sometimes they got to yell at you. Sometimes people have to yell at you to wake you up out of your stupor. And I think if every single one of us listening to me actually processes their life and thinks about their life, there has a, there's at least one point in every single one of our lives where we miss the obvious and we needed friends or sometimes enemies to show us where we were wrong. And once we saw it, we were able to correct our course and do the right thing. I don't care really, you know, whether or not people are like, oh, he's a good guy or he's a bad guy, Joel Osteen, or he only did it. He only did it because Twitter attacked him. I don't care. He did it. And you know what? What's more important than why he did it is the fact that there are 16,000 people who now have shelter tonight. That's what matters. And you know what else I know? I bet you he's never going to forget that shit ever again. I bet you he's never going to make that mistake ever again. So love him or hate him. You know, if you if you tweeted him to attack him or you tweeted him because you're genuinely hurt by this or genuinely upset or surprised, whatever the case, the end result is a dude who had a duty to the city of Houston and to the people of Houston is now living up to that responsibility because friends and enemies helped correct his course. And that's too nice. They slapped the taste out of his mouth, digitally speaking, and he got some get right. So, you know, hey, whatever the case, whatever the reason, whatever the cause, um, <clears throat> what's important, the people are being taken care of tonight. Um, so speaking of Houston, uh, there's a report of a police officer who was on his way um, to to help the people of Houston. And I'm trying to pull up his name. I had it in front of me, but um I, I don't have it in front of me at this moment, uh, but there's a police officer who was on his way to uh, to help in Houston, and he got trapped in a waterway and flooded out and died um, and drowned, unfortunately drowned. Um, there's a memorial uh, going around on Twitter, and I'm trying my best to get to it right now, folks. Um, bear with me. I'm not sure. I'm using this, the same device that I have my notes on. Um, I'm using it now. Um, but, um, uh, it, it just, you know, I, I don't have a whole lot to say about that other than the value of human life in general, man. Um, the Houston police are, um, they tweeted out, it's with a heavy heart that we announced the tragic, um, the tragic in the line of duty death of Sergeant Steve Perez. I have it on my timeline. Um, <clears throat> It's it's the value of human life. I, I'm i not going to put any additional emphasis on the fact that he was a police officer or he wasn't. It's just the value of human life, man. And, and people who will put their lives on the line to help someone else uh, ultimately losing their life. Um, in a way, it reminds me of Heather Hare in Charlottesville. She put her life on the line to help someone else ultimately losing her life. Uh, and I think for, you know, losing her life because it was snatched away from her. Uh, in this case, it was a natural disaster. So they're not apples to apples, but it does still speak to the value of human life that sometimes, um, sometimes when we have, sometimes it gets lost in our day to day conversations. Sometimes it get lost. It definitely gets lost in our day to day um, political existence. I mean, sometimes we just see it and it goes past us and we like, you know, we might bat an eye and we might not bat an eye. Um, but I just, you know, want to pause and, and think about the value of human life that is so precious. The human consciousness, man, is the most impressive thing to me um, because of how rare and how um when, when I say rare, of course, there's billions of people alive with conscious yeah, consciousness today. But in terms of the grand scale of things, you know, consciousness is the most uh, one of the most rare things in the freaking universe. And um, once it's gone, you know, that's partly why I'm a, that's why I'm a, still a Christian, to be honest with you, is because the hope uh, it's just just the pure hope. You know, say what you want to say about it, but it's just the pure hope that my consciousness can exist beyond my body and um, and see, you know, that's that's it, it can, because it's so rare. And and if you think about it, once if it's gone, it's gone. It can never be replaced. That's even more tragic. 
right? So, you know, not to get a whole all misty eyed and metaphysical on you guys, but I just like to every now and then when I see stories like this, I just have to pause because if not, then we belittle human life and it just becomes, you know, these just become stories that go across our desk and we have no connection to it. And, and, that's not the type of person I am. I'm not, you know, no matter how callous I act, how, no matter how many times I call somebody a motherfucker on Twitter, no matter how many times I, you know, act like I'm a hard ass. The truth of the matter is I'm very connected to uh, humanity. And I hope that we all are uh, that to the point where we value life. Um, maybe not the lives of Nazis. <laughs> just i almost want to say i'm joking but i don't know if i'm really joking but still just the human consciousness man human consciousness and so um our thoughts and it's, you know one last thing and then i'm i'm going to go there's a reason why i say thoughts and prayers or hearts and minds if if perhaps the person i'm i'm talking to is not a, a believer they might be an atheist so i say my hearts and minds you know my thoughts and my heart go out to you it's because most of the time there's nothing else that we can do. If there is something that we could do, we have the responsibility to do that first, right? If you're a politician and you're sending thoughts and prayers, save that. There's something that you can do. But like people like me, and now I have something that I could do. I can amplify the voices of people. So I have that responsibility and I, and I, and I accept it gladly. Like if there's something that I can do to help, you know, help in this situation, if you don't even want in Houston, in these situations, if there's a way that my platform can help, then by all means, it's, it's at their disposal, Right. But for the most part, most of us are completely incapable of helping people in these situations. Most people probably couldn't even send five dollars because they don't have five dollars to send. Right. And so that's the reason all we have, if all you have is your thoughts and your heart and your prayers and your your well wishes, then to me, I don't think that's a bad thing to send it because it's at least letting people know that you are thinking of them. Does it change the nature of the situation? Not at all. Uh, does it change their emotional state? Maybe if they want to accept those well wishes, um, I would. I definitely would. Um, and I was talking online with patrons, uh, two patrons who live in Japan, um, and they were uh, notified of these uh, of the incoming um, n ballistic missiles from North Korea. And I was at a loss for words when i was reading their stories in our private patron chat on facebook um which you should become a part of but i'm not going to plug the address here because that would be totally tacky but as i'm listening to <laughs> i'm such an idiot as i'm listening and reading the story i realize there's nothing i can do except to let them know that i care and the only way i can know that i let them know that i care is like you know my thoughts and my heart and my mind, they're there with you. So I'm not, I don't begrudge people who say that. I only begrudge it when there's plenty more that you could do and you choose not to do. And so all you do is give them your thoughts and your prayers. In that case, save your thoughts, save your prayers. I don't even want them. But if you're like most of us and all you have are your well wishes, um, man, never hesitate to tell somebody that you're thinking about them. Um, that's about as mushy of a show as I can offer you guys. Uh, but I think in terms of where we are in society right now, particularly with, with the hurricane in, in Houston and the, and the, and the unbelievable human tragedy, uh, it's recently in Sierra Leone. I mean, there's so many human tragedies across the country. I'm not even going to belittle what I said and call it mushy. I'm just going to offer it to you like this. When you can be kind, be kind. I normally end that by saying when you can be kind, be kind when you can't take no prisoners. But tonight I want to end that just by saying if you can be kind, be kind because we need more kindness. Hey, my thoughts and my hearts and prayers and my well wishes and all those good things. They're with you, whatever you're doing. Thanks so much for supporting the show. Don't worry. Tomorrow I'll get back to my normal gritty, you know, insulting and, you know, all that kind of stuff. But, hey, it's okay. It's okay. Hey, man, hug somebody. <laughs> we're going over. We're going over the board. We're going overboard now. Hug somebody. Let them know you love them, that you're thinking about them, all that good stuff. And, hey, man, I'll see you tomorrow.